Have you heard of Martin Luther? He was a seminal figure in the Protestant Reformation, challenging the Roman Catholic Church's practices and doctrines, notably the sale of indulgences. A German monk, a professor, and a theologian, his 1517 publication of the 95 Theses criticized church corruption and sparked religious, political, and cultural upheavals across all of Europe. His translations of the Bible into the local language made the scripture accessible to the common people for the first time, promoting literacy and empowering individual faith practices. His teachings emphasize salvation by faith alone, the authority of scripture, and the priesthood of all believers, laying foundational principles for the Protestant Reformation and Protestantism in general, dramatically altering the course of Western Christianity. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to see you again. As always, if you want to support the channel, links to Patreon are in the description. And if you would like more people to see my videos, help YouTube push it out by liking and subscribing, and perhaps leaving your comments down below. I always reply. Now, without further ado, and all the good stuff out of the way, let's get busy with today's topic, a biography of Martin Luther. Now, before we begin the video, I will preface that I don't really have a dog in the fight in terms of religious issues. I'm just a bystander relaying the information, and I don't want to approach any of these topics regarding religion with any of my own biases. Of course, I have my own opinions for certain issues, particularly ones surrounding politics and spirituality, but this is a channel for history, not for my opinions. So, with that being said, let's continue. Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483, in Eisleben, that was located within the Holy Roman Empire at the time, to parents Hans Luder, which was later changed to Luther, and Margarethe. He was baptized the following day, honoring St. Martin of Tours. The Luder family relocated to Mansfield in 1484, where Hans, his father, managed a copper mine and a smelter and participated in the local council. He even managed to rise to the position of town councillor in 1492, and that's not bad. Now Luther's mother, described by religious scholar Martin Mary, was a hard-working woman of modest means. This is, of course, contrary to the adversaries of Martin Luther in later times, who disparaged her background, claiming that she was apparently a bath attendant, and even worse, depending on the bath, a lady of the night. Definitely not very kind to Luther's mother. Somebody called my mother that I would punch their lights out. But that's not what this video is about. Let us continue. Now, Luther had several siblings, sharing a close bond, particularly with his brother Jacob. He'll come back later. Hans Luther harbored aspirations for Martin to pursue law, steering him through Latin schools in Mansfield, Magdeburg, and Eisenach, focusing mainly on grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Martin himself would later liken his schooling experience to purgatory and hell. So we're not so different after all. Now by the age of 17, in 1501, Luther enrolled at the University of Erfurt, where he critically recalled as a 
den of vice. Universities haven't changed either, it seems. His curriculum was, of course, rigorous, filled with rote learning and spiritual exercises, culminating in a master's degree in 1505. Initially following his father's wishes to study law, Luther quickly found himself bored to tears and disillusioned with the profession, and was drawn to theology and philosophy, showing keen interest in figures like Aristotle, William of Ockham, and Gabriel Beale. He was notably influenced by tutors such as Bartholomeus Arnoldi von Usingen and Jodocus Trutvetter, who instilled in him a deep scepticism towards established authorities and an emphasis on personal experience for truth-seeking. Luther's political pursuits left him somewhat unfulfilled, and he craved this deeper, more meaningful connection with God, beyond what the pure reason and logic could offer. He thought that there had to be something more, something beyond the mere human understanding. So, he began to develop a critical perspective on reason's role in understanding God, contrasting it with the certainty found in divine revelation and scripture. This led to a pivotal moment on the 2nd of July 1505, when during a rather horrible thunderstorm, a lightning bolt strike led Luther to vow to become a monk if spared from the storm a vow that he viewed as unbreakable. Well, of course, spoiler alert, he survived the storm, so you can guess what his next career move was going to be. He entered St. Augustine's Monastery in Erfurt on the 17th of July, 1505. A decision, of course, put his father in quite a mood and it marked the beginning of Luther's theological journey. Of course, his father did not know that his son was bound for such glory, but who can really predict these things? Well, Luther was having a great time in his new role. He immersed himself fully in the Augustinian way of life, engaging in rigorous fasting, extended prayer sessions, pilgrimages, and regular confession. He later reflected on this time as a period of profound spiritual crisis, feeling alienated from Christ, who he perceived not as his saviour, but as a punitive figure overseeing his torment. Recognizing Luther's spiritual turmoil, Johann von Staupitz, his mentor, believed that engaging Luther in more active pursuits might alleviate his introspective tendencies. So, he steered Luther towards that academic path, and consequently, Luther was ordained by Jerome Schultz the Bishop of Brandenburg in Erfurt Cathedral, on the 3rd of April, 1507. In the next year, 1508, Luther's academic journey led him to teach, specifically theology, of course, at the University of Wittenberg. He achieved academic milestones rapidly, earning two bachelor's degrees, one in Biblical Studies in 1508, and another focusing on Peter Lombard's sentences in 1509. Luther's scholarly efforts culminated on October 19, 1512, when he attained his doctorate in theology. On the 21st of October 1512, Luther joined the Theological Faculty's Senate, 
at the University of Wittenberg and took over from von Storbitz as the chair of theology, a role he retained for the duration of his career. By 1515, Luther's responsibilities expanded as he was appointed the provincial vicar of Saxony and Thuringia, overseeing a total of eleven monasteries. And let me just remind you, this is all happening within the space of a few years, very early in his career, so it's extremely impressive. Well, between the years of 1510 and 1520, Luther's teachings began to take shape as he lectured on the Psalms and the books of the Hebrews, Romans, and Galatians. His study led him to question the Catholic Church's use of terms like penance and righteousness, ultimately viewing the Church of having strayed from the key Christian tenets. Central to Luther's doctrine was the concept of justification by faith alone, a transformative idea that salvation is simply a gift from God's grace, and it's accessible solely through faith in Jesus Christ. So, there's no barrier to entry. It's not like saying, well, you are a Christian, you believe in Jesus, but you don't show up to church, so you're not getting into heaven. Well, Luther was breaking from this idea. I like it, to be honest. It's a good idea. Well, Luther articulated that justification was purely God's work, a stance elaborated in his 1525 response to Desiderius Erasmus on the bondage of the will. Further reading if you're interested. He underscored that righteousness was simply the gift from Christ, imputed to all believers through their faith, countering the prevailing belief that righteous acts involved cooperation with God. Well, for Luther, faith was not just pivotal, but a divine gift that led to a rebirth and entrance into paradise. An epiphany he described as discovering the righteousness of God itself. He detailed his views on the justification in the Smalkald Articles, emphasizing that faith in Christ's sacrifice is the sole path to justification, a fundamental truth unyielding to any human work, merit, or law. Mm, yeah, the third one, that's where it becomes a problem for those in trow trower? Power, rather. Excuse me. Now, this foundational principle, according to Luther, was non-negotiable, even if it meant the collapse of the world as known. In 1516, the Roman Catholic Church tasked the Dominican friar, Johann Tetzel, with selling indulgences in Germany, to fund the reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Tetzel, known for his indulgence preaching, was appointed by Albrecht von Brandenburg, Archbishop of Mainz, who needed to repay debts and contribute a substantial amount towards the basilica's rebuild. Albrecht had secured approval from Pope Leo X for a special indulgence sale, with proceeds to be split between Albrecht's debts and the Basilica. Now, just quickly, I may not have a complete understanding of what indulgences are, but from what I understand, there are effectively little trinkets you can buy for good boy points with the church. And of course, that makes God happy. It's kind of like making a donation to the church, but you get something in return, besides the exciting lectures. Well, this was a big deal to Martin Luther. He thought it was complete nonsense. In fact, it annoyed him so much 
that he put his life on the line for it. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther voiced his objection to this practice in a letter to the bishop, Ulbrich von Brandenburg, including his disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences, which was later known as the Ninety-Five Theses. It was basically a big list of his grievances, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, Luther's challenge, though academic, questioned the Church's practices. Notably, it criticized the Pope's reliance on the poor for funding the Basilica. Luther refuted Tetzel's claim that indulgences could ensure salvation. That was the main part of the theses, and he had a whole bunch of reasons on this that were based in theology that he had studied, and they were all pretty good. It emphasized forgiveness was solely God's domain. Well, of course, I know that there is the notion that Luther had nailed them to the front of the door in Wittenberg Church. And, yes, this could have happened, but it has been somewhat debated. A lot of modern scholars, and indeed a few contemporary ones, question that authenticity, despite its prominence in Luther's legacy. Now, there's no real way for me to disprove that he did it, but there's also no real way to prove that he did. So, let's, for excitement's sake, go with the exciting option of he did, but put it down to my own opinion on the matter. Anyway, the 95 theses were translated into German quickly, and they rapidly spread all the way across Germany, and then when they reached other countries, they were translated into the local language of that country, and so on, and so on. This marked the beginning of Luther's most influential period. Now, Archbishop Ulbricht, upon receiving Luther's 95 Theses, did not directly address them, but he did check them for heresy, which was very important, before forwarding them to Rome in December 1517. Of course, he was financially invested in the indulgence sale, needing funds to pay for a papal dispensation due to holding multiple bishoprics. Pope Leo X, accustomed to dealing with reformers, as there was quite a few of them, initially responded to Luther's challenge with caution. But over the next three years, he deployed theologians and envoys against Luther, which only solidified Luther's stance against papal authority. He was digging the boots in at this point, and he was not going anywhere. The conflict escalated when Dominican theologian Sylvester Mazzolini prepared a heresy case against Luther, whom Leo X then summoned to Rome. Now this is a big deal if you know anything about Christian history in the medieval times, even if it's only an abridged version of it. Well, you know what a heresy trial can end up for the person on the pointy end of it. The elector Frederick intervened, however, convincing the Pope to allow Luther to be examined for heresy in Augsburg during the imperial diet. The confrontation between Luther and Cardinal Cajetan, the papal legate, in the October of 1518 turned into not a calm theological debate, but rather a heated dispute with plenty of raised voices, particularly over the issue of indulgences where many fingers were pointed at those making all the money for it. <laughs> 
well, Luther's refusal to recant his criticisms, and his assertion that the Pope was not above scripture, oof, this marked him as a direct opponent of the papacy. He was making enemies in high places, but also quite a few friends. The man on the street was starting to take a shine to him. Well, despite Cardinal Cajetan's initial orders to arrest Luther if he did not recant, Luther managed to leave Augsburg secretly, with assistance from Christoph Langenmantel, a Camelite friar. In a more diplomatic attempt, papal nuncio Karl von Miltitz met with Luther in January of 1519, where Luther agreed to silence provided his opponents did the same. However, theologian Johann Eck sought to challenge Luther in the public, leading to a disputation with Luther's colleague Andreas Karlstadt, and then with Luther himself in Leipzig in June and July of 1519. In this debate, Luther argued against the Pope's sole authority to interpret scripture, and against the infallibility of popes and church councils, earning him the label of a new Jan Hus from Eck. From then on, Eck dedicated himself to opposing Luther, further entrenching the divide between Luther and the Catholic Church. Well, in June of 1520, Pope Leo X issued an official warning to Luther, with the papal bull called Exerge Domine, threatening his complete excommunication, unless he recanted not all of the 95 Theses, but 41 specific statements from his writings. Well, that fall, Eck publicized the bull in several towns. Efforts by von Miltitz to mediate were unsuccessful, and Luther, having already sent the Pope on his work, the, oh, I beg your pardon, sent the Pope his work on the freedom of a Christian, publicly burned the papal bull and all related decrees in Wittenberg on the 10th of December 1520, defending this action in subsequent writings. So you can see how, even with the whole church against him, the Pope threatening excommunication and a heresy charge over his head, he responds to this by burning the papal bull, in front of everybody in the middle of town? Well, that is some courage, for sure. Well, of course, this got him excommunicated. On the 3rd of January, 1521. Now, despite later agreements between Lutherans, Methodists, and the Catholic Church on the doctrine of justification by faith, Luther's excommunication from 1521 still remains in effect to this very day. He's still excommunicated. I mean, the Catholic Church would sooner forgive Judas Iscariot than they would Martin Luther. Well, the task of enforcing the ban on Luther's writings which was going to be quite a task as they were everywhere, fell to the secular authorities, and it led to Luther's appearance at the Diet of Worms in April 1521, before Emperor Charles V. Worms is the town, by the way, that the Diet was held in. And yes, the first time I heard Diet of Worms, I thought the same. Now, questioned by John Eck about the authorship of the content of his books, 
Luther affirmed he wrote them, but sought time to consider his stance on their content. The following day, he famously declared that he could not recant his teachings without scriptural or rational evidence against them, citing his conscience and, of course, the word of God. Eck accused Luther of heretical interpretation of scripture, referencing historical heresies supported by biblical texts to argue the danger of Luther's stance. Despite the lack of consensus on whether Luther, Luther actually said the words, Here I stand, I can do no other. The statement is often attributed to him as reflecting his defiance. Now, after days of deliberation, the Edict of Worms was issued on the 25th of May, 1521, declaring Luther an outlaw, banning all of his works, and making it permissible to kill him without consequence. The last one was the worst part. Frederick III orchestrated Luther's discreet abduction en route to Wittenberg, with Luther being whisked away to Wartburg's castle's safety, which he dubbed My Patmos. Here, Luther had a lot of time alone to think, and of course, to work. And he did. He embarked on many significant projects, including translating the entire New Testament into German, and writing a lot of his own books extensively, including texts that criticized Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz for his indulgence sales, and others that clarified his doctrine of justification by faith alone. And he has really quite an extensive bibliography. It really is impressive. His writings during his Wartburg stay tackled core church practices, citing the mass as a form of idolatry and questioning the necessity of confession and monastic views. He argued that faith and God's grace, not works or vows, were the real paths to salvation. Despite his physical absence, Luther stayed informed about Wittenberg's escalating religious reforms led by Andreas Karlstadt and others, which soon spiraled into radical changes and unrest. Disturbed by the reports of the revolutionary zeal and disorder, Luther felt compelled to return to Wittenberg, despite the risks, to address the theological and social upheavals. After all, this was his idea in the first place. He didn't want people to take those ideas and run off with them. Even after re-establishing order in Wittenberg, Martin found himself unable to suppress radical movements across the broader region. In our modern vernacular, we may say, you can't put the toothpaste back into the tube. Influential preachers, including Thomas Munster and Nicholas Storch, gained the support of the lower strata and the peasants from 1521 to 1525, exploiting long-standing grievances that had previously sparked smaller and less successful revolts. Luther's critical writings against the ecclesiastical establishment, perceived as liberally worded, misled many people into thinking that he would be the one to stand up as a champion of a broad social upheaval against the ruling classes, take that boot off the back of the peasants. This misunderstanding, of course, fueled significant revolts, particularly in regions like Swabia, Franconia, and Thuringia by 1524, 
with movements gaining momentum under leaders like Munster in Thuringia, drawing even the financially troubled nobility into the fray, escalating into what had effectively become an outright conflict. Luther, while emphasizing, empathizing rather, with some of the peasants' complaints, notably in his response to the Twelve Articles in May 1525, ultimately urged respect for secular authority. He was trying to drop them back into first gear a little bit. In fact, his horror, complete horror, at the rebels' destructions of religious and cultural sites during a tour of Thuringia, prompted his even more vehement denouncement in his work against the murderous, thieving hordes of peasants. So you can tell what kind of flavor that work was going to have. Well, in this work he branded the violence as satanic and urged the nobility to crush the insurrection. Luther's stance was rooted in the belief that rebellion contradicted divine command to submit to governing authorities, as outlined in Romans 13, 1-7, equating peasant actions with lawlessness deserving death and blasphemy for masquerading their revolt under Christian pretenses. Well, of course, everyone felt somewhat betrayed by Luther's condemnation. Well, it led many of the insurgents to simply surrender, and they were decisively defeated at the Battle of Frankenhausen on the 15th of May, 1525. And, of course, Munster, well, he was executed. This effectively ended the revolutionary phase of the Reformation. Radical elements, however, found asylum within the Anabaptist movement, whereas Lutheranism progressed shielded by state apparatus. Reflecting on the events, Luther attributed the suppression of the revolt to his own directives, a bit of a pat on the back. Well, at the age of 41, he did something a little different. He got married to Katharina von Bora. She was a former nun who he helped escape from the Nimshen Casterian Covenant in April 1523, using herring bad barrels for their stealthy departure. That's right, they hid in there like... Donkey Kong on their way out. That's a romantic story, isn't it? Well, Luther, who had been deeply engrossed in his work, and far from contemplating marriage, described this unexpected turn in his life as an act of God that suddenly committed him to matrimony. The engagement was formalized on the 13th of June, 1525, witnessed by noble figures such as Johannes Bugenhagen and Philip Melanchthon, with the marriage being officiated by Bugenhagen on the same day. The traditional celebratory customs were initially omitted, but they did them two weeks later. Luther's marriage marked a significant endorsement of clerical marriage, challenging the traditional vow of celibacy that was always imposed on the clergy. This decision actually surprised many of his contemporaries, including Melanchthon, who deemed it a little bit hasty, especially considering Luther's previous declarations of intent to remain single due to his perilous state as a heretic expecting martyrdom. Of course, what's the point in getting married if you're about to be murdered. Prudent decision. Luther himself had admitted to experiencing the 
natural desires of the flesh. Yet he had been living austerely, neglecting even basic self-care. Now moving into the Black Cloister, a gift from Elector John the Steadfast, Luther and Katharina built a life together, despite frequent financial difficulties. Their union was blessed with six children, though they faced the sorrow of losing two of them young. Either way, it seems like Martin's proclivities had somewhat expanded as he settled into married life. Katerina, well, she managed the household adeptly, involving herself in farming and boarding to contribute to the family's income. Luther expressed profound affection and satisfaction with his marriage, valuing the companionship and support Katerina provided above any sort of wealth. By 1526, Martin was deeply involved in the task of shaping a new church. Initially, he had envisioned congregations independently selecting their ministers, a concept that proved a little bit impractical. Luther aspired for a church that was both confessional, drawing on personal faith, and territorial, encompassing residents of all localities. He eventually gravitated towards a model that prioritized inclusivity. Between 1525 and 1529, Luther established a church supervisory body, introduced a new form of worship, and succinctly summarized the emerging faith through two catechisms. Aiming for gradual reform, Luther sought to minimize disruption and avoid replacing one authoritarian regime with another. His efforts were concentrated in the electorate of Saxony, providing guidance to churches in newer territories that often emulated the Saxon example. Collaborating with Elector John the Steadfast, Luther leaned on secular leadership for the church's financial needs, given its loss of assets post-separation from Rome. This collaboration marked a shift towards state-influenced church governance, a development that Luther had not originally intended. The elector also took over visitation rites previously held by bishops, further entrenching secular influence in church affairs. Luther's reforms sometimes appeared to backtrack on his earlier, more radical positions, though. For instance, despite advocating justification by faith alone, a 1528 instruction co-authored with Melanchthon, emphasized repentance for sin forgiveness. This, of course, sparked more than a bit of criticism from some reformers who accused Luther of diluting his stance on faith and works. Fair criticism. Well, to cater to German-speaking congregants, Luther created a German mass in 1526, as an alternative to his earlier Latin Mass adaptation. This Mass was designed for the layperson, simplifying the service while maintaining some traditional elements. Luther's Mass encouraged congregational participation through hymns and psalms in German, and incorporated catechism into weekday services for educational purposes. Despite criticisms from other reformers for its perceived similarities to Catholic Mass, Luther's version was notably more congregant-focused. During a visitation in 1527, Luther and his associates introduced this new order of worship, 
and evaluated pastoral care and Christian education within the electorate of Saxony. Luther was dismayed by the general lack of doctrinal knowledge among the populace, and the adequate teaching skills of many of the pastors. Luther introduced the Catechism as an instructional tool to teach the core principles of Christianity to his followers. In 1529, he authored two versions, the large Catechism for pastors and teachers, and the small Catechism intended for the general populace to memorize. These works focused on essential Christian doctrines, like the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, and the Lord's Supper. You know, all the basic, easy stuff. Presenting them in an accessible question-and-answer format. Luther aimed for a deeper understanding of faith, rather than just mere rote memorization. He viewed the Catechism as one of his most significant contributions, valuing it as the, uh, valuing it rather, and the bondage of the will above his other writings. The small Catechism in particular gained acclaim for its clarity in teaching, continuing to be a vital tool in religious education alongside Luther's hymns and his Bible translation. The catechisms were instrumental not only in church settings, but also in the more practical aspect of helping parents educate their children about the faith, using the German language to make the teachings more relatable. Luther personalized the Apostles' Creed in the Catechisms, portraying the Trinity not just as a concept, but as three distinct persons actively involved in the believers' lives. The Father who creates, the Son who redeems, and the Spirit who sanctifies. This approach aimed to make the doctrine of the Trinity a more intimate and relatable aspect of faith for the learner, emphasizing a personal relationship with each divine person. Luther's catechetical methods sought to connect the foundational Christian teachings of the Decalogue and the Lord's Prayer with the experiential reality of the Trinity's work in the lives of believers. Luther released his German translation of the New Testament in 1522, followed up by the Old Testament translation in 1534, which culminated in the complete Luther Bible. He continually refined the translation details, all the way up to his death. And while there were Previous German translations, such as the Mentelin and Coburger Bibles, Luther's version was unique for being closely aligned with his own doctrinal beliefs. Using the German vernacular of the Saxon Chancellery, he made the Bible accessible to both northern and southern Germans. He aimed for a translation that was both vigorous and direct, to ensure it was readable by the common people, coinciding with a rising demand for German language texts. His Bible, annotated with his notes and featuring woodcuts by Lucas Cranach with anti-papal themes, played a pivotal role in disseminating his teachings all the way across Germany. The translation also influenced other vernacular traditions, like the Tyndale Bible, which is the precursor to the King James Bible. Luther famously added the word alone after faith in Romans 3.28 to emphasize that faith without work justifies us a point which he believed was clear from the text of the essence of Christian doctrine. 
He also made a decision to exclude the passage of 1 John 5 to 7, 8, uh, also known as joining comma, citing it as a forgery. It further shows his commitment to a translation that reflected his own specific theological understanding. Well, this choice was later contested, and the passage was rather sneakily, posthumously inserted back into the Bible. Contrary to the interpretations of John Calvin and Philip Melanchthon, Luther believed that a Christian soul enters a state of sleep after death, rather than immediately experiencing either the joys of heaven or the torments of hell. He argued against the traditional reading of certain biblical passages, such as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, suggesting instead that souls rest peacefully until the resurrection. Luther explicitly rejected the concept of purgatory, a place of purification for souls, which was a departure from the established church doctrine. He maintained that personal identity as well persists beyond death, proposing that saints are asleep in their graves, and at the same time exist in heaven. This view diverged not only from his contemporaries, but also from latter Lutheran theologians, like John Gerhard, who did not share Luther's conception of soul sleep. Historical analysis, including those by Lessing and Franz Pieper, have highlighted this doctrinal difference within Lutheran orthodoxy. Well, if you want to know, why don't you go and ask the local Lutheran church? I'm sure you can find one. They're always happy to answer questions about theology. Now, Luther's commentary on Genesis includes a discussion on the state of the soul, suggesting that it remains awake and experiences visions, contrasting with the notion of soul sleep. However, this has been a point of contention amongst scholars. Some argue that there have been a misinterpretation of Luther's words, with further clarification provided by Gottfried Fritzel. Fritzel explains that Luther was actually referring to the restful sleep of a laborer in his life, disrupted by dreams, rather than commenting on the state of the soul after death. Okay, then. In October 1529, the Marlberg Colloquy was convened by Philip I, Landgrave of Hesse, gathering theologians from German and Swiss backgrounds to discourage and forge a unified doctrine for the Protestant movement. Among these present were significant figures, such as Zingli, Melanchthon, Martin Bucher, and Johannes Oclemnapidius, <laughs> excuse me, Oecolampidius. Well, the assembly found common ground on pretty much all topics, except for their understanding of the Eucharist, particularly the nature of Christ's presence within the sacrament. Luther staunchly defended the real presence, the belief that Christ's actual body and blood was present in the bread and the wine, a view that he articulated through the concept of sacramental union. This stood in contrast to the spiritual or symbolic presence that was advocated by others, notably Zingli. Now, as for the discussions, which were, at time, heated, showed their profound differences. Zingli's citation of John 6.63 as evidence against Luther's stance prompted a rather robust response from Luther, emphasizing his unwavering position by inscribing, This is my body on his table. <laughs> 
doing the old Terminator 2 scratching in with the knife sort of thing. Well, despite these intense debates, the colloquy did contribute indirectly to future Protestant unity through the Augsburg Confession, and also the foundation of the Schmalkaldic League, though Swiss cities did abstain from these agreements. Now on to a few of uh, Luther's other views. His views on the relationship between faith and reason sparked considerable academic debate on their own. He is often quoted as suggesting a stark opposition between faith and reason, with faith occupying a realm that was beyond the reach of reason. Yet Luther also indicated that enlightened reason could support and advance faith challenging interpretations of him as a fideist. During the Marburg Colloquy in 1529, a significant external threat loomed over Europe. Suleiman, the magnificent Ottoman forces, were besieging Vienna, presenting a critical moment that intersected with the religious discussions of the time. Martin's stance on the Turkish threat was complex and evolved as time went on. Initially, in his 1518 explanation of the 95 Theses, Luther viewed the Turks, or specifically the Ottoman Turks, as a divine scourge that was only meant to punish Christians a perspective that stirred controversy and led to accusations of defeatism. He interpreted the presence of the Turks as part of a biblical apocalypse aimed at destroying the Antichrist, which, to Luther, was represented by the papacy and the Roman Church, and I'm sure you can imagine what they thought about all of this. Well, despite his theological interpretation, Luther opposed the concept of a holy war against the Turks, asserting that such a conflict would be contradictory to the teachings of Christ. However, his position nuanced over time, especially in light of ongoing Ottoman advances in Europe. While maintaining his stance against a religious war, Luther began to advocate for secular warfare as a legitimate defense against the Ottoman encroachment. By 1526, he recognized the legitimacy of just wars for national defense in his work, whether soldiers can be in a state of grace, in, and by 1529, in on war against the Turk. He actively called for Emperor Charles V and the German populace to engage in secular combat against the Ottoman threat. Luther distinguished this call to arms from a spiritual battle, which he believes should be fought through prayer and repentance only. In addition to his writings on warfare, Luther's engagement with the Islamic faith and practice is also noteworthy. After reading a Latin translation of the Quran in 1542, Luther authored several critical pamphlets on Islam, referring to it as Muhammadanism, or the Turk. Although he viewed Islam as a deception of the devil, Luther advocated for religious tolerance, arguing against the prohibition of the Quran's publication. I'm as surprised as you are. He believed in exposing the Islamic texts to scrutiny, rather than simply suppressing them, stating, and I quote, let the Turk believe and live as he will, just as one lets the papacy and other false Christians live. In early 1537, Johannes Agricola, a pastor in Martin Luther's hometown of Eisleben, delivered a controversial sermon 
suggesting that the gospel, and not the Ten Commandments, reveals God's wrath to Christians. Agricola's ideas reflected in anonymous antinomian thesis circulating in Wittenberg propose that Christians need not be taught the law, as it pertains solely to civic matters, not spiritual life. Luther, suspecting Agricola's involvement in these theses, responded vigorously through six sets of counter-theses with counter-arguments and several writings between 1538 and 1540, aiming to clarify and defend the role of God's law in Christian life. Luther argued against the antinomian stance by emphasizing the second use of the law, where the law serves as a tool for the Holy Spirit to induce sorrow over sin, preparing the heart for gospel. He maintained that ignoring the Ten Commandments among Christians doesn't erase the inherent accusatory nature of the law. To preach otherwise would imply that Christians are sinless, ignoring the ongoing presence of sin and the necessity for continual repentance. Moreover, Luther highlighted the third use of the law, viewing the Ten Commandments as a positive guide for Christian living and reflecting God's eternal will along with the natural law. He taught that the life of Christ exemplifies the Ten Commandments, providing a model for Christians to emulate in their daily lives and vocations. Luther saw the commandments as a foreshadowing of the believer's future perfection in heaven, urging Christians to serve their neighbors in this world with an eschatological hope. The controversy over Philip I, landgrave of Hesse's bigamy in 1539-40, further complicated Luther's legacy. Philip sought Luther's approval to take a second wife, citing the polygamy of biblical patriarchs. Luther, alongside theologians like Melanchthon and Boucher, reluctantly suggested that if Philip proceeded, he should do so secretly to avoid scandal, viewing divorce as a greater evil than bigamy. The marriage was conducted in secret, but when it became public, and it always does, Luther advised Philip to simply deny it, a stance that backfired and damaged Luther's reputation. It reminds me of that song, Shaggy, It, it, it Wasn't Me. Sorry to go off topic for now. Well... Critics argue that Luther's major error was underestimating the political and social ramifications of his pastoral advice. And this whole episode was a very controversial and frankly embarrassing episode of his career. I mean, it is terrible advice what he gave to Philip. Just do it in secret and hope that nobody finds out. Well, speaking of controversies, you knew I was going to get to it eventually, didn't you? It has taken one hour, but we are here. What did Martin think about the Jews? Well, throughout his life, and his entire life. Martin Luther expressed very negative sentiments about them. Influenced by a theological and cultural tradition that viewed the Jews as responsible for Jesus' death. Luther's environment had expelled Jews nearly a century prior, and his encounters with them were pretty minimal. 
Initially, in 1523, Luther advocated for kindness towards Jews in that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, hoping to convert them to Christianity. But his attitude hardened over time due to the lack of success in converting Jews. Now, in 1543, Luther wrote two significant anti-Jewish works, the most famous one being On the Jews and Their Lies, which is, you can pretty much find it if you look pretty hard, and another one, On the Holy Name and the Lineage of Christ, advocating extreme measures against Jews, labeling them as the devil's people, and using all sorts of other violent language. He suggested actions such as burning their synagogues, confiscating all of their property, and outright expelling them. Luther's rhetoric was so intense that it has been interpreted by some as inciting murder. I mean, it pretty much is, isn't it? Well, additionally, Luther associated Jews with vagrants in his 1528 preface to Liber Vagatorum, suggesting that alms should not be given to them. His anti-Jewish stands contributed to the suffering of Jews in Saxony, Brandenburg and Silesia. Josel of Roshim, a Jewish representative, attributed the Jews' misfortune directly to Luther, and unsuccessfully sought to restrict the sale of Luther's writings in Strasbourg after they were used to incite violence against Jews. Well, it would be like trying to stop the sale of Harry Potter in the early 2000s. It was just far too popular. Luther's impact, though, extended beyond his death, with writings influencing anti-Jewish actions, including riots and expulsions in several German Lutheran states during the 1580s. His vehemently anti-Jewish stance has led some, like the Orthodox Jewish rabbi Tovaya Singer, to describe Luther as the most vitriolic of the Church Fathers and Reformers in his attacks on the Jews. Well, he couldn't stay alive and persecute the Jews forever, couldn't he? As his health began to decline significantly from 1531 onwards, he experienced a range of ailments, including Meniere's disease, vertigo, fainting, tinnitus, a cataract, kidney and bladder stones, arthritis, and even an ear infection that led to a ruptured eardrum. Throw in a bout of angina starting in 1536, he had it all. Of course, no one's really themselves when they're sick, and you can really sense this different tone in his writings at this time, as his deteriorating health made him increasingly irritable and more blunt, not only in his writings, but also his public comments, to which his wife bore the brunt of, often pointing out his rudeness. Well, despite his health issues, Luther remained active in his duties, for better or worse. In 1545 and 46, he preached at the market church in Hall, and spent Christmas with his friend Justus Jonas. His last sermon, delivered in Aisleben, his birthplace, on the 15th of February, 1546, vehemently criticized the Jews and called for their expulsion from Germany, unless they converted to Christianity. The sermon, of course, echoed his harsh stance towards the Jews, advocating to their conversion, but also labeling them as enemies, which made you wonder, would the conversion really be enough? 
Of course, it never really was in the medieval times. They would be labelled as conversos, those Jews who were sort of first-generation Christians. Kind of like this. Well, Luther's final days were spent in Mansfield, where he was involved in negotiations concerning his family's copper mining business. Threatened by Count Albrecht of Mansfield's attempts to monopolize the industry. After successful negotiations on February 17, 1546, Luther began to suffer chest pains and began to pray that night, anticipating his end. Well, like clockwork, early on the February 18th, after a second bout of chest pain, he confirmed his faith and teachings to his companions, Justus Jonas and Michael Coelius, with a clear yes. He then suffered a stroke that left him speechless and passed away at 2.45 a.m., 62 years old. Luther was buried at the Schlosskirche in Wittenberg, as per his wishes, in a funeral held by his close associates, Johannes Bugenhagen and Philip Melanchthon. His grave remained undisturbed, even when Charles V, his opponent, took control of Wittenberg, as Charles specifically ordered his troops not to disturb his final resting place. And they didn't. Well, that was the life of Martin Luther. Was it everything you thought it was going to be? Quite a long video, wasn't it? Well, there'll be plenty more long videos where that came from. I'd like to thank my top-tier Patreon supporters, Stark Factory, JC, and Jeffrey. Thank you very much. If you'd like to support the channel, as always, you know what to do. But until next time, thank you again for joining me. It's been a pleasure. We learned so much. I will see you in the next video. Good night.